going to read three scriptures. And these particular scriptures are found in the New Testament. And the first one is in Luke chapter 23 and verse 33. And in Luke chapter 23 and 33, and you don't need to worry if you don't have a Bible, I'll read it as clearly as I can. It's concerning Jesus and it's concerning his crucifixion. And here's what it says. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors. Those are the other thieves, robbers, one on the right hand and the other on the left. So they crucified him and the malefactors, one on his right hand side and one on his left hand side. If you go to the end of the Bible, almost the very last page, to Revelation and chapter 21, I want to pick up something there that will show us in the future what it will be like. Revelation chapter 21 and reading from verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Very solemn indeed. I'm now going to go back to one more verse found in the gospel according to Matthew. And in the gospel according to Matthew in chapter 27, we have here the words of Pilate when he was faced with Jesus and whether or not he was to be crucified. And in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 22, Matthew 27 and 22 says, Pilate saith unto them, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, let him be crucified. And the governor said, why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more saying, let him be crucified. What shall I do then with Jesus? I want to consider with you, please, three crosses, two communities, and one choice. Three crosses result in two communities that follow from one choice. And the whole point of me opening up the word of God with you this evening is that you will come face to face with Jesus Christ, who he is, what he has done, and that you yourself will make a choice. And you will be faced with this. We are all faced with choices. We're all faced with decisions. And I hardly need to say to an audience like this that every one of your decisions have consequences. And it's going to result. It's going to result in different communities forever. Silhouetted that day, just outside the city of Jerusalem, just as the sun was just rising in the, uh, in the mid-morning, you would have seen three crosses. We're going back now to the year AD 32, AD 33, somewhere in there. And we're going back to that moment when Jesus, the only perfect person that's ever lived, was taken outside the city with two absolute rascals, two people that had broken the law. That's why they were called malefactors, thieves, robbers. These were people that were now going to be crucified because of their own crimes. And these three individuals, the only perfect person that ever lived, and two that were evidence of a broken law were taken outside of Jerusalem. I don't know if all three had crosses on their backs, but I do know that the Lord Jesus Christ did. And he, the only perfect one with a cross on his back, was being ushered now outside of the city of Jerusalem to be nailed by their hands and by their feet on, that, on those crosses and lifted up they were to die. You can just see them now. Three men cut down, no doubt, in the prime of their life. Three were real living human beings. A terrible form, I know. 
a terrible form of punishment, a terrible form of, of capital punishment. But I don't want to concentrate so much on just the awfulness of such a death. I want you to contemplate who was, di who was dying. I want you to contemplate with me who was nailed to those crosses. I've already said two for their own sins. But there was another man. And when the crowd cried for his blood, you can imagine the judge saying, why? What evil has he done? And ladies and gentlemen, the whole point, the whole point of this terrible scene was the fact that that middle man, who was going to be the mediator between <coughs> God and man, that middle man had no sin of his own. He couldn't actually. It was impossible for Jesus to sin. He being the very God of eternity who has stepped into time. He being the very son of God, he could not sin or the Godhead would literally explode, if you will. It would be totally inconsistent. It would be incompatible within itself. And Jesus, the very son of God, could not sin. I stress that because the reason why I can preach you to you and have him as a savior to present to you is based on the fact that he has never, ever sinned. And so there he is. And he's nailed to the cross just the same way as malefactor number one and malefactor number two. There they are, lifted up to die. Lifted up now. The only intention of the Roman soldiers is to see that these three men die in accord with their law, such as it was. And if you were to draw close to that scene, you would hear arguments going on. You would hear people literally spitting out their contempt. You say, I can imagine. I can imagine. I can imagine them spitting out their contempt thievery, robbers, murderers. We don't have much time for them. You can imagine that they'd be spitting at them for sure and scorning them and mocking them. You can imagine that. But if you were to draw near, friend, and come near to that cross, when I read the accounts, I find that the one that they're spitting at, and the one that they're mocking, and the one that they have just been so crude towards, even the religious people, don't think for a moment that the religious people were somehow protecting the sinless son of God. They were the ones casting in his teeth their, their contempt. You say there's something wrong here. Indeed, there was. Totally wrong. Totally wrong. The only sinless man that ever walked on planet Earth, the very son of God who became man, is the subject of abuse from sinners themselves. But if you come even closer, you would hear what that man on the center cross is saying. You say, well, he's going to give it to them good now. He, he's going to lay it on the line now. You see these sinners that are bombarding him with all sorts of abuse. He's going to get them now, you say. Yes, I'll tell you what he got them with. He caught them with a prayer, an intercessory prayer. And as they nailed him to that cross, you hear the Lord Jesus Christ say, Father, get them bad. They're doing damage. Not a bit. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I don't know if that prayer made any impression upon the people around about. I personally am convinced that that prayer was answered by God. For Jerusalem was not going to be destroyed for another 40 years or so, 35, 36 years. A whole generation was going to be preserved by the prayer of Jesus Christ. And the day that in Titus, the, the um, general of the Roman forces comes in and decimates Jerusalem. I tell you, God had been long suffering. And the prayer of the Lord Jesus to forgive that current generation, they know not what they do, I believe personally was answered. But there was someone else who heard it. You see these two thieves that are nailed on either side? They also, can you imagine? They also had been 
spitting contempt towards Christ. Yes, that's what criminals do. They're, they're so upset and frantic in their own state that they begin to turn on one another. You could almost consider this to be a bit of a prison riot, except their hands and their feet have been paled upon a cross. And so all they've got left is their teeth. And they gnashed against him with their teeth. But one of them heard that prayer. One of them heard the Lord Jesus and his compassion, and his kindness. One of them at least acknowledged that this man who had no sin of his own, who was being nailed to a cross, was absolutely and totally different to them. So he is, friend. The Lord Jesus is totally different to you and to me. He had no sin of his own, but you and I are tainted by it. We're stained by it. We're saturated by it. And the problem with you and the problem with me and the problem with all of humanity is that we come short of the glory of God. And my, do we come short. Come short. We're an infinite distance away from God because of our sin. Well, as that thief, I don't know which one it was, whether it was the one on the right hand or the left eye, I don't know which one it was. But I'll tell you this, it made some deep impression upon him. And then he begins to change his mind. He begins to change his mind as to who the man on the middle cross really is. There's something about this man that's hanging on this cross that is totally different than everyone else. He prays with a knowledge of God, his father. He loves his fellow human beings that are really his enemies. There's something different. And if we draw close, we would hear that one thief say to the other thief, don't you know? Don't you know that we are getting what we deserve? But this man, he hasn't done anything wrong. Don't you know? That man, that thief, recognized something by viewing Christ, that he himself was a sinner, and he was getting exactly what he deserved. My friend, I might shock you, but if I got exactly what I deserved, it would be hellfire, a banishment from God forever. And could I even shock you more? You're in danger of going to hell. You're in danger of being away from God for eternity. Your sins are taking you there. Oh, the solemn reality that if we reject God and we choose our own way, and if we are just imbibing sin and, and we're saturated in it, as I said in the beginning, and now we're, we're subject to it, we're slaves to it, and, and now we're perpetrators of it. And, and you might just say, is there any, what's the end of a man like that? The end is hellfire. Solemn reality. And so I do have to say, I do have to say that when this man is beginning to realize that his sin has consequences and his sin, he's getting what he deserves. But this man in the middle, oh, this man in the middle, he's done nothing wrong. But listen, listen to what that thief then says. He turns to a man whose hands and feet are impaled upon that cross. He turns to the man above his head, says, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Oh, it might have been said in mockery. But nonetheless, he truly was Jesus. The name means Savior. And he truly, truly was from Nazareth, that contemptible place. And he truly, truly was the king of the Jews. And he turns to him and he says this. Now get this. I don't know who told. I don't know who told that repentant thief all about the Lord Jesus? Was it only the title above his head saying king? Was it his prayer? Was it his sinless manifestation of just, just being so right through it all? But here's what he said. He said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Lord, remember me. Oh, that that would just be the prayer of someone's heart just now. That you realizing your sin and you realizing just who you are and realizing that Christ has never done anything wrong and realizing he's the king of the universe. 
realizing he's the son of God, that you would have crying out in your heart just now, Lord, remember me, remember me. When thou comest into thy kingdom, I don't know how he knew, but he was looking at a man and said, a man like that, who seemingly has no future left in this world, certainly has a future left in the universe, surely has a future left in paradise. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom and the Lord Jesus turns to him and with full command and dignity says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. No false promise, no gasping weak voice, just the calm assurance of the son of God as he promises a poor repentant thief a place in heaven. You say, that was a remarkable, remarkable conversation. Indeed, it was. Indeed, it was. You see the other thief? We don't read of him changing his mind. We don't read of him turning to Christ for a place in heaven. We don't read of him admitting his own sin. And from that cross that day, may I venture to say, Humanity that is divided right down the middle was put on display there at Calvary's Hill with the man in the middle, the Lord Jesus, being the deciding factor between one who goes to paradise and the other that is totally unrepentant and is still reviling God. You say, what will the end be of that? That's why I read to you in Revelation in chapter 21. Because from those three crosses come two communities, two eternal communities made up of people like you and like me, made, made up of just normal human beings. But in one, one community, it seems to be bliss, satisfaction, an inheritance. A character that's so completely changed. And in the other community, we have eight words that describe the type of people that are going to be in that particular place. And these communities are divided. The one who is able to divide them is the one who says, I make all things new. He says, it's done. It's done. And the solemn reality, I say to all my listeners here tonight, the solemn reality is that God has said various things have been done down through history. He, he looked at creation and he says it's good. He places mankind into creation and he says it's very good. But we wrecked it. We wrecked it with our sin. We spoiled it with our wickedness. But God is not somehow thwarted by the silliness, the foolishness and the sin of man. God had a rescue plan. And that rescue plan involved the Lord Jesus going to that center cross. That rescue plan was that the sinless, spotless, holy son of God would become answerable for the sinner's sin. And that he on that cross would die not only for sin and for sins, but he would die for sinners. And becoming a ransom, a substitutionary ransom. He gives to God what you and I could never give. He dies on that cross, but in doing so is a sacrifice for sin. In doing so, in dying on that cross, he takes the penalty against himself so that the guilty can go free. And the guilty is you and the guilty is me. And the remarkable thing. And we're only told this in the Bible. Historical facts can be established by historians. But spiritual truth is revealed by God through the apostles. And here's what they wrote. Christ died for our sins. Here's what they wrote. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Here's what they wrote. God commendeth his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us us when we were enemies we were reconciled by the death of his cross i tell you this the cross where jesus died is the place where god heaped upon his son the the iniquity of us all made him to answer for it 
treated his son as if he was treating sin. And there on that cross, when Jesus died, he actually was opening up a life gate so that you and I would, you and I would be able to be part of that blissful community. He's the one who decides where we go. And God has simply stated in his word, whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God has simply stated in his word, he that hath the son hath life. God has made it so clear that even a child can take it in. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You'll have to come. Maybe there's a sophisticated gentleman. Maybe there's a very rich lady listening in. Let me tell you, you'll have to come just as a little child. You'll have to come the, to Christ the way everybody has to. You, you'll have to just bow the knee and acknowledge that you are the guilty sinner. But the Lord Jesus has died for the sinner like you. And you'll be able to take it in and say, therefore, he has died for me. Now, if you receive Christ, you are coming into the good of what he cried on that cross. It is finished. Can I say to some of you that are maybe working, trying to get your way to heaven? Stop. The work's been done. Maybe some are trying to pay through penance and various things. Stop. The work is done. When the Savior cried, tis finished. Everything was fully done. Done as God himself would have it. That's it. And he laid it upon his son, and his son bore it. He died on the cross. That's the way God would have it. And that's what completed our salvation. Oh, he looked at creation. Good. He looked with man in creation. Very good. He looked at the mess of the world, sent his son to die for our sins. And his, his son cried, it is finished. My friend, this world is going to be judged for what they did do to the Lord Jesus by nailing him to the cross. And if I went to Revelation chapter 16, I would find words that say this. It is done. And it'll be just the finishing of all the judgments against this world that's to come. I tell you, this judgment's coming. This is God's time of grace. And he's lengthening it and lengthening it so that more and more can be brought in and be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. But you see the words I've just read to you now. It is done. This is when he completes everything. It is done. He says everything's new. The present earth and heavens will have passed away. He'll make a new earth, a new heaven. This is something eternal. And look at it, friend. There's two communities, I stress. And this man that said it is done, he is the one that will be the satisfaction of one community. They'll rejoice. They drunk in the truth when they were alive. And now that they have entered eternity, he'll say, I'll supply you with a with an everlasting satisfaction. I'll give you the fountain of the water of life freely. I'll give you an inheritance. Uh, in fact, I'll place you just as if you're the same level as the son. The son of God. You say, I'd like to be there. You can be there. You can be there. The good news of the gospel is that you can be there. You say, how can I be there? Be like that thief on the cross. Those three crosses. With Christ in the middle. Dividing humanity. It's the one who repented and believed on Christ that was saved. And the other one who rejected Christ was lost. My friend, if you come into the good of what that thief came into, you too will enter paradise. You too will inherit. You too will be able to come and drink of the fountain of the water of life freely. It'll be yours, friend. Heaven will be yours. But there's only one way to heaven, and that's through the one who says it is done. The one who says, I am Alpha and Omega. He is the, the very one who is the, he's not only the expression of God, but he's, he's just the master of his history. And everything that can be written of the history of humanity, he's the Alpha and he's the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He transcends time. If you want to be saved, it begins with Christ and it ends with Christ. Because it is Christ. The only way to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and you'll be saved. That's what the promise of the Bible is. And so I want to speak to my friends. Maybe there's someone here, and I don't know who all who's all listening, but it could be some of my friends from the Orient. If they were on the call, I would tell them, you don't need to be following Confucius. You don't need to be following all the Shintoism and the Buddhism. Oh, they might be wise philosophies in measure, but let me tell you, let me tell you this. There's one way to heaven. There's one way to paradise. There's one way to be saved. Let me tell all my friends that would be from the Middle East. And let me tell you, I know some of you are absolute gentlemen. I've worked with you. I've had you in my office for years. I know what it's like to work with you. And I might think you're a tremendous neighbor, but I want to tell you this most solemnly. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. No one else. Let me talk to the atheists. I'll tell you this. You'll only be an atheist for a short period of time. When I come to verse 8 to describe this other community, I want you to notice how God describes the people. He says, I want you to know that there's one community in the bliss of heaven, and there's another community in the burnings of hell. In fact, he calls it the, the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. That, that fear that we would have of, of fire. Let me tell you this. I don't know how literal this is. All I know is hell will be worse than the literal. How solemn. Do you see who heads the list? The fearful. They wouldn't trust. Fear and trust are the two opposites. They would not trust God. They would not count the cost. Or if they did, they decided they just couldn't believe on the Lord Jesus. They couldn't risk it. They were too afraid maybe of what others have said. Too afraid, oh, I can't see it. I can't. But the fearful, head the list, and the unbelieving. People that just reject. They heard the message. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And they said, I don't believe it. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the fornicators. That's what whoremongering is here. The fornicators. I, I speak carefully. I just want to say to people that are listening in, this is not something to be trifled with. We, we live right now in a world that hardly thinks anything of just living in a promiscuous way. The fornicators, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars. From every strata of society, whether they be the rich and the famous, whether they be the poor and the unknown, all the liars. Those that would not believe God, those that would just spit out back at him like that thief did, the unrepentant. You see all those? I'm just going to read to you what it says in the Bible. Their part. In the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The first death is when the body and the soul are separated. But you see, these people, they've been resurrected. Their body and soul are together again. This second death is when God and that person are separated. If God is love, this place knows no love. If God is light, this place knows no light. If God is a God of liberation, this place knows no liberty. If God is a God of life, this place is called death. And so, friend, there's two communities. Three crosses. Oh, the middle one died for our sins. Results in two communities. Now you have a choice, one choice. What will I do then with Jesus? You say, I don't believe it. I caution you, sir. I caution you. There's a community 
that will be filled with unbelievers. Oh, you say, I I'm too afraid. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't trust someone. I, I have never seen them. Well, let me just caution you. The fearful. Oh, I don't care about Christ. I'll live whatever way I want. I don't need to be married. I don't need all of these, these things that the Bible talks about. I'll live whatever way I want. You be careful, ma'am. You be careful, sir. It says here, the fornicators, the sorcerers, the idolaters, all liars. You see, these are the characters that God consigns to that community that's called the second death. And so I leave you then with that choice. I present to you three crosses. And when we were children, we used to sing three crosses standing side by side. Of a broken law, it was a sign. And it went on to say, two, for their own transgressions died. The middle one for mine. A concise chorus, I know. But those two were guilty as sinners, but not the middle one. And when Christ died, he was dying for sin. He was dying for sins. He was dying for sinners. Was he dying there on that cross for you? That should be your question. Well, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? The Bible invites you to come near and believe on him. The God of heaven says, you believe on my son and I'll receive you to myself. The God of heaven leaves you with a choice. What will it be tonight? Am I speaking to some younger ones? Maybe you've listened to the gospel many times. You have a choice to make. Don't make the wrong one. By the time nightfall came at Calvary, there were three that had died. The scene was over. Clothed in darkness. You cannot boast yourself of tomorrow. Now is salvation's day. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the time that you need to decide for Christ. And believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll be saved. And you'll say, thank God I'll never be in the community of the burning lake. I will be in the place that is just brimful of love. I'll be in heaven. When life is over, three crosses standing side by side led to two communities. And the question is, which one will it be for you? The answer is what you will do with Jesus. What will your answer be? That's the key. That is the vital question that needs to be answered. I beseech you in the name of Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for what the Lord Jesus did on that cross. We thank thee that when he rose again the third day, it proved that what he accomplished there was to the satisfaction of heaven. And it also proved, Father, that there is true life that he can give. And we would long that each one listening might humbly repent of their sin and trust thy son. We'd ask thee then that thou would take thy word and impress it upon someone. That as they would exclaim, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? That in their hearts, they'll be able to receive him and believe on him to the salvation of their souls. Father, bless thy word. Bless all those that have organized this meeting and bless the assemblies represented, we pray, as we retire now for the night in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Elton, for that solemn searching and